Okay, so last week we looked at Jesus walking on the water. Uh, who are the only two people ever to walk on water that we're aware of? Yeah. We often forget that Peter walked on water, too, at least for a little bit of time there. And uh, we saw last week that Jesus, after seeing the multitude, wanted to make him king by force. He sent him away because it wasn't his time to be a physical king on earth. When does that time come? When does the time come for him to be a physical king on earth? Was it his first coming or at his second, second coming? Okay. Well, he'll set up his millennial reign. He'll rule the nations with a rod of iron, the Bible says. He'll rule believers and unbelievers. Now, believers won't need the rod of iron in the millennial kingdom. The unbelievers will. Of course, if you want to read more about it, you can read Zechariah 14. <clears throat> but he, he sent the, the crowds away and then he sent the disciples away. Let them go across the sea. And, uh, you know, they had maybe, I don't know, six to eight miles to go, I think, or maybe it was ten miles, I can't remember what it was, to go from where they were going to where they were going to be. And uh, they were out there for quite some time. Had a lot of time to think about what they just saw. Did they have any kind of, were they in any kind of awe when they saw Jesus do what he did with the 5,000 men plus women and children? They weren't in awe of that, were they? Which doesn't really make much sense. So they had lots of time to think about that. Because they were out there from the beginning of evening, around 6 o'clock, till 3 to 6 a.m. in the morning. Lots of time to row and to think about these things. And Jesus saw them afar off, and um, what possibly could have happened as Jesus was walking on the water? He could have, what, walked right by them in the midst of their troubles, in the midst of their storm. If they were paying so much attention to their rowing and trying to get there on their own strength, and they wouldn't have seen it. They, you know, even if it was not Jesus, it was a ghost. If they were just paying so much attention to what they're doing, they wouldn't have even seen him walk by. But they saw him walk by, and they were fearful at first. And that's very ap- applicable to us. Because oftentimes in our troubles, we can let Jesus walk right by us. Not allow him to work in our lives in the midst of our troubles. Be so focused on the troubles themselves, instead of focused on the author and perfecter of our faith. So we need to be focused on Jesus at all times, especially in the midst of our troubles. And that's oftentimes when God works the most in our hearts. There's this old saying I heard a long time ago, I don't remember who I heard it from, but I think it's very applicable. You know, in our day and age of digital media, it's not really going to make much sense to some people, but back in the old days, they used to develop film. And you'd get physical pictures. You, you wouldn't get a chance to, to pick and choose which pictures you wanted to print out and which ones you didn't want to print out. You took the whole roll of film, you gave it to them, they printed it all out, and you probably got half of them with thumbs in front of them, the other ones are blurry, and you had to pay for them anyway. Um, but the saying goes like this. Just like film, faith develops the best in the dark. Just like film, faith develops the best in the dark. Because in the darkness, you, you, you have to cling to Christ. You have to cling to Him more than any other time. And so it's good to be in those places. Not, it's not pleasant at times when we're in those places. But it's good for our own good to be in those places. And so we saw that last week. And we saw what was their response after they saw Jesus walk on water. He got into the boat. They saw Peter walk on water. Okay, imagine that. That's not just Jesus walking on water, but all the other stuff is like, wow, Peter's walking on water too. But what, why did Peter start to sink? Took his eyes off Jesus. Looked at the boisterous winds around him. And they were boisterous because they had only gone three or four miles in a matter of like, what, seven, eight hours? That's pretty slow. So they're dealing with those things. And what was their, their, their response when they saw all these things happen? They got to the shore immediately, and the wind ceased immediately when Jesus got into the boat. Yeah. They were starting to get it. They were amazed. They were starting to get it. And so it's always uh, pleasant when someone begins to get it. It is. Whether it's ourselves or whether it's someone else. It's always pleasant to see that. This is we're going to go through Matthew 15, 1 through 20. Let's start in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. 
So he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? <clears throat> For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift to God, that he need not honor his father or mother. Then you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So we have here these Pharisees and scribes who came all the way from Jerusalem to Galilee. That's about a 75-mile walk. They came a long way. And what did they come to dispute about? Man-made traditions. Man, they sure were zealous for their man-made traditions. And there's lots of people out there who are the same way. Their traditions are not based upon the Word of God. You show them that, they get upset, and they'll go to great lengths to promote their man-made traditions. They'll write books, they'll produce documentaries, they'll make videos, they'll call you, say lies about you, do all kinds of things to promote their man-made traditions. Now these, these Pharisees and scribes came all the way from Jerusalem, 75 miles, and what's the first thing they do? They complain that the disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat. Man, they really are deceived. They really are deluded. And, you know, Jesus is, this is the, these are the very people who Jesus, uh, when he did healings, they said he was of Beelzebub. They considered demonic what he was doing. And these are the very same people who, the reason why he began to teach in parables. Because they were not submitting to the knowledge they were receiving. They're rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. And now they've gone so far as to travel 75 miles to complain about traditions. Not things based upon Scripture. This, you won't find this washing hands anywhere in the Old Testament. This is not a sin here to not wash your hands. Now, if you want to be, you know, good, have good hygiene, I recommend it. I recommend you wash your hands after you change a diaper, after you use the restroom, before you cook meals, before you eat your food. I recommend that. But to say that someone is in sin for doing that, there's a problem with that. It's a problem with that. Because that, now you're exalting this tradition, this caution, this whatever you have, you're exalting it to God's word. Because only God's word determines what is sin and what is not sin. Now I'll tell you, friends, we need to be very careful of this. You know, we're a holiness group, I would consider us. But be careful not to become a legalistic group. And not make things that are not found in God's word to be God's word. I'm reminding of, uh, reminded of when I was went to the Southern Baptist Convention in Greensboro, North Carolina, back in 2006, and um, there was this dispute in the Southern Baptist Convention over alcohol. And you know they were arguing that we should denounce it altogether, we should get rid of it, we should basically call it a sin. And these men would rise up and go to the microphone and say, well, it's not a sin to, to drink alcohol at all. It's just a sin to get drunk. And they were, they were trying to push that forward. And, and eventually the Southern Baptist Convention said, no, we're just going to reject it together. We're basically going to try to get everyone away from it and just not do it at all. Now, that's 
if, if you want to do that, if that's your that's my standard, I, I'm planning on never drinking another ounce of alcohol in my life. Uh, that may be your standard as well. But for me to tell someone that if they have some wine in their kitchen and they drink a glass of wine every once in a while, they're in sin? Now I've exalted something that's not God's law to the point of being God's law. And telling someone they're in sin when they're actually not in sin. So we have to be very careful, friends, that we're not taking our external standards for ourselves, for our families, even for our fellowship, and saying, this is the way you must be, otherwise you're in sin. Be very careful about that, friends. It's just as bad as living in impurity. It's sin. Simply put. Simply put. So they came all that way to talk about a man-made tradition. Now, there are good traditions. Let's talk about traditions just for a second here. We talked about this when we talked about the head coverings, 1 Corinthians 11.2. There are, not every tradition is bad. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11.2, Paul says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Okay? And the Greek word tradition there literally means content of instruction handed down. Content of instruction handed down. So, tradition is not always bad. Paul was praising the brethren for remembering him in all things and keeping the tradition just as he delivered to them, uh, to, uh, to them. And then we go to 2 Thessalonians. And Paul goes a step further with these traditions. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So the church of the Thessal uh, uh, Thessalonica, they had traditions given to them, content of instruction handed down, and given to them through epistle, and of course orally as well. Now keep in mind, the Thessalonians didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the rest of the, the New Testament. All they had were the epistles that were sent to them. Okay, and maybe some other general epistles that were sent to their area. But they didn't have the whole counsel of God like we have. Okay, so they're all traditions that Paul passed on and expected them to, to hold and stand fast. And then in chapter 3 and verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So if you weren't walking according to the tradition that Paul had given to the church of Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3.6, then people were supposed to withdraw from you. So there are good traditions. Now I just got done reading this book uh, called Common Sense uh, by David Brousseau. And uh, lots of things I didn't like in it, unfortunately, but... Uh, he supposes, from these verses I just gave, it talks about oral tradition, that there's some oral traditions that we don't have in the Word of God that we're supposed to obey. Uh, here's the problem I have with that. Uh, God's Word is inspired, correct? So it's the objective standard which we, d we take from it all the things for our practice and our life and our faith, how we're supposed to live. If there's oral traditions that we're supposed to obey that aren't in the Word of God, isn't God kind of leaving us in the dark here? It's incomplete. It's incomplete. And so, he try, basically, his, he tries in his book to break down a rule of hermeneutics. And I could break down his hermeneutics, I think, even though he wouldn't say this himself in the book, out, 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 out like this, is that the Word of God is ambiguous and incomplete, Therefore, we need the early church fathers, and we need them to interpret the Bible for us and to give us the tradition we need. Okay, so in this book, David Brousseau basically, if I, he tries to set a rule of hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics, once again, just for those who don't understand that word, means principles for interpreting the Bible. Okay, and he gives several rules, but I could break down his rules into basically two rules. One rule is that the Word of God is ambiguous. And it's incomplete. That's the first rule. The second rule is this. The early church fathers complete it and interpret the Bible for us. We need to submit ourselves to them. 
That's basically what it breaks down to, and I have a problem with that, because the Word of God is not ambiguous, it is not incomplete, and if that's the basis for the second rule, then I have to reject the second rule as well. The Word of God is understandable. He know, God knows who He's trying to communicate to here. And he, He's not trying to give us, keep us in the darkness, or keep us confused. God's not the author of confusion, the Bible says. God's the author of order. And so He wants us to understand the Scriptures. Now, other church fathers are, are, are good to understand the history of the church, but I don't accept everything they say just because they said or just because they were closer to the apostles. We're to understand the scriptures for ourselves. And I believe 1 John 2.27 talks about this. Okay, He didn't say in 1 John 2.27, the apostle uh, John, when he was writing that, uh, he didn't say, well, you need no one to teach you, but listen to the people who come after me, you'll need them to teach you. Uh, no, he doesn't say this. Says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So the anointing we have from God, from the Holy Spirit, can teach us all things and lead us into all truth. And so we don't necessarily have to have. But the traditions, there are traditions, and I think we all the traditions we need to have for godliness, for faith, for good doctrine, is found right here. So we need. So we need. Okay, so getting back to Matthew 15 here, um, not every tradition is bad, but these traditions they were doing were bad because they're calling people sinful for not obeying these traditions, and these traditions are not founded upon the Word of God. They're man made. Now, the tradition kind of went like this you're supposed to wash your hands before meals and after meals. And if you're really zealous, you'd wash your hands in between courses, too. You know, and and they, they think this makes them uh, more pious. But washing the outside of the cup, does that make you clean? Inside. If you, if you were going to eat a bowl of cereal, and you have it had two options, the outside of the bowl is clean or the inside of the bowl is clean, what are you going to pick? Inside. Yes. Very good. Um, they also have, let's go to Mark 7, uh, verses 3 and 4, the Mark account of the situation. He gives even more details about what they expected. Um, it says in Mark 7, verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come in from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. So, yeah, couches. Uh, now, they wouldn't actually wash the same way they washed the copper vessels, and the, they'd sprinkle it. But they would st these are not couches like this. They're like the ones you sit on when you're eating. Uh, but they, it all involved cleansing and purification uh, outwardly. And if you remember back in John 2, 6 through 8, where Jesus was at the wedding in Cana, there, when they asked for, when he, his mom's like, well, they, don't have, they ran out of wine. It's like, okay, well, go get these pictures filled up with water. Those are the kind of pictures we're talking about here. They had these pictures already prepared and ready to hold water, to be clean, clean pictures with clean water in it. So they had these things. And so that they're... they're their traditions went further than just washing your hands. The pitchers you got the water had to be clean in a certain way. and The couches you sat on around the table had to be clean in a certain way. And so they're, they're having a problem with the disciples not obeying these things. Uh, so it wasn't a matter of just good hygiene for them. Which is good. I mean, it's good to wash your hands. It was a matter of sinfulness. They considered it to be sinful. And according to Adam Clark's commentary, people back then would be excommunicated from the church if they didn't obey these things. That's how serious they considered it. Okay? Uh, and Jesus, he doesn't even answer their question. And this is, a, this is a good thing to do a lot of times. When you're in open air, people ask you a question, you respond back to the question in a way that addresses their question in a roundabout kind of way. For example, if someone goes open air and says, the, do you ever speed? You know, they're trying to catch you in some kind of sin, I guess you could say. Do you ever speed? You say, well, do you have sex outside of marriage? Well, yes. Well, then why are you talking to me about speeding? When you're, when you're involved in this other sin, and it's kind of, it's kind of funny, it reminds me of uh, Brother Jesse preaching in downtown Shreveport. That's the very thing that happened. This guy was trying to catch him in all kinds of things, and Jesse wasn't, ca he wasn't catching him anything. He said, well, what about you? He said, well, yeah, I'm having sex outside of marriage. He said, well, then you're condemned anyway. Why are you even talking to me about myself? You're condemning yourself. And that's basically what Jesus is telling them here. Who is really the guilty party here, the disciples for not washing their hands or the Pharisees for not obeying the word of God? Yeah, 
Yeah. And let's, let's see what, what they were, you know, this, this is advice they were giving people who were coming to them. And, you know, the word of God says, honor your father and mother. And he who curses father and mother, which means you're not honoring them, let him be put to death. That's how serious this was. Let him be put to death. And honoring your father and mother, according to this passage, includes taking care of them, materially, financially. In fact, let's, let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now in this passage, they're talking about uh, widows here, but it deals with more than just widows. Uh, the principle still applies across the board. Um, and it talks about the church, how they're supposed to take care of certain widows who really are widows, basically who have no one to take care of them. Um, and in verse 4, it says this about the widows, where they really are widows or not. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents or grandparents. For this is good and acceptable before God. So, your parents come to the point where they can't take care of themselves, then your obligation is to take care of them. If my father, who's a non-Christian, comes to the point where he can't take care of himself, I'm going to ask him to come here and move with, and live, in with, live with us. My mother, my stepfather, her, her father, her mother, if it happens to any of them, I'm under obligation as a Christian to take care of them. Not turn them over to the government and let the government take care of them. Not turn them over to some church and let them take care of them. This is what it's addressing here. But I'm obligated to take care of them. And so are you. That's what you're supposed to do. That's honoring your father and your mother, which also, obviously, according to verse 4, extends to grandmother and grandfather. So you're supposed to honor them, too. But then in verse 8, it says this about those who don't obey that command, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for his, those of his household, He's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's not just talking about providing for your children, if you're a man or a woman. It's talking about providing for your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather. If you refuse to do that, you're worse than an unbeliever. You're a sinner. You're in trouble with God. You stop it. You honor your father and mother. And so Jesus... Uh, Paul addresses the very thing, same thing that Jesus addresses here. That they're supposed to take care of them. Now, these people who are supposed to honor their father and mother, if they didn't, they're supposed to be put to death. Were the Pharisees putting them to death? Hmm. So, the Pharisees were going a step further than saying, my man-made tradition is law. It's sin if you don't wash your hands. Now, they're taking this other tradition, and they're nullifying the Word of God, completely contradicting the Word of God, and flipping it around to be something that wasn't made to be in the first place. Twisting the scriptures. And so these people uh, who the Pharisees were teaching were taught that they really didn't have to honor their father and mother. That they could simply say, as it says in Mark, it says in, uh, in Matthew here, Matthew 15, 5, it says, a gift to God. And Mark, it says, Corbin. What that basically means is that, oh, this thing that I could have given to you to help you, it might, that you might have received, it says in Matthew, oh, Corbin. I've set it apart for God. What a wicked excuse that is. It's like saying, well, you know, uh, I'm sorry you're, you're having some problems this month, Mom and Dad, but you know, I, have to, I have to tithe to the church. I'm obligated to give my 10%. Or, you know, I've set this apart for this, Mom and Dad. No, God tells you to take care of your family. You're obligated to that. God, that's, God doesn't even want that kind of money. God doesn't want that kind of gift. And the question really remains with these people who were doing this, were they really giving it to God in the first place? Or were they just saying that and using it for their own greedy means, their own greedy gain? And according to uh, Adam, Adam Clark's commentary, there were people back in that time uh, who were, they were Pharisees who were involved in this. And they were actually giving these people an excuse and they were getting some of the money from it. And, you know, it makes me think of these pastors and churches of this day who try to sneak into old ladies' houses and get them to give their inheritance to the church instead of to their family who might really need it. And uh, it's not right. It's not right. 
Uh, God commands you to take care of your family first. You know, I have a life insurance policy, and if I were to give it all to some missionary and leave my wife and children out in the cold, if I were to die tomorrow, that'd be wicked. That's exactly what these people are doing here. Um, but we're assuming that they actually are doing that. I don't know if they really are. And so they, they uh, these people were involved in this, and possibly the Pharisees were getting paid off to keep quiet. And uh, maybe some of them were very guilty uh, of the same thing. This also happened with the Roman Catholic Church. You know, they were trying to build their great big churches, these Gothic-style churches. And they would trick people into believing that if they gave their money to the church, their inheritance to the church, that it would save them and their family members. So, the, you know, these people are being deceived, but they're being tricked by these leaders of these churches. And they'll have to give an account for it. The same thing with the indulgences. We talked about indulgences before. You know, the saying that as the, the copper hits the, the coin hits the bottom of the copper pot, the soul is released from purgatory into heaven. What wickedness. But that's what we see uh, going on here, is that they're not obeying the word of God, and this other tradition they have, besides the washing of hands, is actually nullifying the word of God and causing other people to sin. And... Uh, he calls them hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you. These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, so we have these people who are drawing near to God with their mouth. They're honoring God with their lips. But are they really worshiping God? So I want everyone to examine themselves. When you uh, sung to God this morning, were you just drawing near to Him with your mouth and honoring Him with your lips? Was your heart far from Him? That's the question you must ask yourself. Is your heart far from Him? Don't become one of these people who just goes through the motions. Every, every Sunday or every Wednesday or every day during the week when you're singing to God. I know in our house we have worship music playing, we're singing to God. Don't draw near to Him with your mouth and honor Him with lips, but let your heart be far from Him. God wants it from your heart, not from your lips, not from your mouth. He wants it from your heart. Now, of course, you can give it to Him from your mouth, from your lips, as long as it's coming from your heart. But it must be both and, not either or. And getting into this thing again, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. Okay, in Romans chapter 14, this issue is dealt with a little bit by the Apostle Paul. And the context here is meat sacrificed or offered up to idols. And whether you could eat these things or not. And uh, there's some things I want to I want you to po- I want to point out to you after I read through. I'm just going to read through the first uh, six verses here. Thanks. I'll read through the first eight verses. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Now, there's doubtful things that we're dealing with here. The traditions of men are doubtful things. These aren't things that are set in stone. You must do this, you can't do this. You must do this, you can't do this. These are doubtful things. Things we can't, we can't be sure about. We can't say it's sin or not sin. For one who believes, he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. So there's people who, when it comes to meat sacrificed to idols, they eat it all. But he who is weak eats only vegetables. First thing I want to point out to you. The person who's restricting themselves more is the weaker brother. The person who's putting more rules upon himself that are not necessarily found in the Word of God, he is the weaker brother. Oftentimes we think that the person who has the most rules in their life and these most, more, all these standards in their life that are not necessarily found from the Word of God, they're the stronger brother. But in here, he's called the weaker brother. And just, just to clarify, it's not talking about vegetarianism here, okay, and eating meat. It's not talking about that. It's talking about meat sacrificed to idols and restraining from that, eating just vegetables because of that purpose, not because of anything else. 
Let not him who eats the meat sacrifice to idols despise him who does not eat the meat sacrifice to idols. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. So God has received both of them. Received both of them. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now, oftentimes, this verse 4 is used either in open air or by people on YouTube who try to say, you can't judge people. You shouldn't be judging God's servant. If you're judging him, you're being in sin. But this is about doubtful things here. It's not about a brother involved in drunkenness, or the brother involved in fornication, or the brother involved in morality. This is over doubtful things, things the Word of God doesn't say. This, do this, and don't do this. Do this, and don't do this. It's about preferences here unbiblical or extra-biblical traditions. But it is talking about that if you have a tradition that is not found directly upon the Word of God, and you're judging your brother or your sister because they're not doing the very same thing, then you're in the wrong in your judgment, according to what Paul is saying here. And then he goes on to talk about a completely different subject, but the same issue here. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. You know, if you want to be a Seventh-day Adventist and say that you're going to worship only on a Saturday, I have no problem with that. Just don't impose it upon me. The Bible doesn't say that. I esteem every day alike. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And just, uh, let's see here, one more thing. I don't want, I want, I want, want to read through the whole passage here. I just want to read one more thing here. Okay, verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So let everyone be convinced in their own mind. Paul even said he was convinced in verse 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Just talking about issues of conscience, issues of preference, and... Um, if you're doing something that your conscience or God tells you is wrong, and you're doing it, then you're condemning yourself. But no one else should be condemning you if they have a different preference on these issues. They're talking about doubtful things once again, and we shouldn't be judging our brothers and sisters over doubtful things, things that are not directly found upon the Word of God. Um, and if we do that, we're teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Very dangerous place to be. And I'll tell you this, that's, that's you know, the two things that really can break up a fellowship or a church more than anything else is lack of purity and legalism. Lack of purity and legalism. Not living holy, which includes obeying all, obeying all the commandments of God, and trying to push your preferences upon someone else. So the two things that can harm and divide a fellowship or a church quicker than anything else. You know, I've been in churches where, or I've heard of churches at least, and I've been in churches where they, that happened in the past, where churches were broken up because they had strong disagreements over the color of the carpet when they were going to replace the carpet. You know? Or the curtains. Yeah. Or decorations during Christmas time. Or, you know, how big the altar is going to be. Or well, different things. People just preference this. And they, they separate over these things. This is just ridiculous. There should be um, should be mercy and forgiveness, and there should be uh, patience in the body of Christ. And then Jesus, after saying this to the Pharisees, when he had called the multitude to himself, so now he's dealt with the Pharisees. He's had some strong words for them. Pharisee, you call it hypocrites. They're not. They're in vain. They worship. And now he says to all. The multitudes, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. The disciples came and said to him, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? 
So the disciples were kind of uneasy here. There was something in the Pharisees that they were seeing that they were offended at what Jesus said. And was Jesus concerned about offending them? No, he wasn't concerned about offending them. So when people tell us, you're offending everybody here, everyone's getting mad at you. Well, that doesn't mean I'm being sinful. That doesn't mean I'm doing anything wrong. You know, and most times the people you're offending the most are the, the religious hypocrites who are just like these Pharisees. Just like them. And they get offended. So the disciples were uneasy. And um, Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Now, some Calvinists will use this verse to say, well, look, the Pharisees were not predestined from the foundation of the world. They weren't planted by God. And that's what Jesus is saying here. They're just reprobates. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's what he's saying here. Uh, as we've been reading through Matthew, what, what comes to your mind when you hear about this every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted? What comes to your mind? Ah, parable of the wheat and tares. Let's go back and just look at that just for a second. Uh, Matthew 13, verse uh, 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he, then he, but he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, and gather the wheat into my barn. So God is going to deal with these people who have not been planted by him, um, they planted by the enemy. Uh, but remember what Jesus said in Matthew 12, he said either, Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruits. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. These are evil men bringing forth the evil treasure of their hearts. They were bad trees. And they have a choice to make themselves into a good tree if they want to. And some of the leadership of, of the Israelites were saved. Nicodemus comes to mind. Joseph of Arimathea. These were part of the leadership. I'm not sure if they were in the group that were here this time. But they heard Jesus speak hard words to the Pharisees. And they were, they were saved. They decided to become a good tree. So they were offended. And he said, don't worry about it. They're, they're, not, they're not from me. They're wicked ones. Uh, they're planted by the enemy. And he says, let them alone. So he's basically saying, have nothing to do with them. Ignore them. Forget about them. Don't worry about them. Why? Because they are blind leaders of the blind. You follow them, what are you? You're blind. You follow the blind leaders, you must be blind yourself. And so when you follow these kind of leaders, these kind of teachers, uh, who are teaching things that nullify the Word of God, like saying, you can't live holy. They're blind leaders of the blind. And where are the blind, leader, where are the blind leaders and the blind getting up in the end? In a ditch. If you don't end up in the ditch with them, stop following them. If anyone's teaching anything that's nullifying the Word of God, or making of no effect in, in your life because it's contradicting the Word of God by their man-made tradition. They're blind leaders. They're leading. And people who are following them are blind as well because they're following a blind leader. And who, who is the only person who would logically follow a blind leader? A blind person. And there's a blind leader and you're not blind, you'd get in front of him and make sure he's going the right way. You would actually become the leader, not him. And so that's what Jesus is trying to do here. That's why he talked to the whole multitude. Hear and understand. Don't be blind like these blind leaders. Now, he didn't say that, that part to them. He said it to his disciples. But that's what he's trying to do. Get people to stop being blind and follow these blind leaders. And Peter answered and said to him, Explain the parable to us. So he said, Are you still without understanding? 
Jesus is surprised by this. Because by now they should have understanding. And this is a roundabout kind of rebuke to those who are intellectually lazy. They don't use their mind and their brain to think properly. They're not loving God with all their mind. They let everyone else do the thinking for them. But we need to think for ourselves. Take the example of the Bereans and think these things through for ourselves. Otherwise, how can we check what we're hearing from other people? How can we possibly do that? No matter who it is. It's a rebuke to the intellectually lazy. And they should have understood what it meant. I mean, it was, I, mean I don't know how much clearer you can get than verse 11. And obviously, Jesus is talking about two different kinds of defilement here than the Pharisees are. The Pharisees are talking about a defilement that's physical, but I think it applies morally and makes someone sinful. Jesus is separating the two. There's physical defilement and there's moral defilement. And Jesus is saying physical defilement does not compute with moral defilement. So what goes in your mouth does not defile you morally. And as Paul said, that everything, he, he was convinced that everything was clean for him. So it doesn't make him sinful for eating, eating things like that. Let's go to James chapter 3, and verse 1. James chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm just going to read this through here, James 3, 1 through 12. I'm not really going to expound on it much. I think it's pretty uh, self-explanatory about this thing that out of the heart precedes these things. And uh, why your mouth, your tongue is so important to reveal what's really in your heart. Uh, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. What does the teacher use to teach? His mouth, his tongue. For all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. The springs send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Can't be a good tree and a bad tree. You can't produce good fruit and bad fruit. You can't be a a fresh or salt water and a fresh water spring. You can't produce fig trees and grapes and olives on the same plant. It doesn't happen that way. And so we must keep a tight ring in our tongue lest our religion become worthless, as James says in James 1. But out of our mouth comes the overflow of our heart. It reveals our, our heart, what is going on in our heart. Um, but these things that come out of, proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Now the question becomes is this. Those who believe in original sin, sinful nature, etc. would say, well, this is talking about someone who's born this way. This is an involuntary thing. If you have a wicked heart, you're automatically going to be forced to produce these things. Like we have no ability to change our heart anytime we want to. But does that say that here in this passage? And have we seen anything yet in Matthew that's given us that idea that we can't change our heart? Or can't change what kind of tree you are? Or that we can't repent of sin? So people assume that the heart is something you're born with and you're in an involuntary state that you can't control what your heart does. Now the heart is really synonymous with the will. Out of your will, out of your heart. You know, we think of the heart, the physical heart, 
in the Greek is cardia, where we get cardiac arrest from. It, it's the center of our being. It's if our heart fails, the rest of our body is going to fail. So it pumps the blood throughout our body. And so out of our will, out of our heart flows our true life, what we are really like. But these things, are, sin doesn't flow from what we eat. Sin doesn't flow from what goes in our mouth. It flows what comes out of our mouth because that shows our heart. It shows our will. It shows what we have our will set upon. Is it set upon sin? Or is it set upon God? And so Jesus finally says, These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. And let's fill in the blank here. I'm going to put a blank here. These are the things which defile a man, but to blank does not defile a man. Fill in the blank. Any man-made tradition that's not found upon the Word of God, any preference you have, any doubtful thing you have, fill in the blank right there. These are things that are defiled men. But to do this, put whatever you want to put in there, that's a man-made tradition, does not defile a man. Fill in the blank, friends. Make sure you put the right things in that blank, of course. It's founded upon the Word of God. Don't put it in that blank. It's part of the second part. It does defile you. But it's not founded upon the Word of God. It doesn't defile someone. If God tells you to do it, it'll defile you. But everyone must be convinced in their own mind, like Paul was convinced in his mind in Romans 14. Because anything that's not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. And the last thing I'll say, I meant to bring this up in Romans 14, is that, you know, the weaker brother there, obviously, as I said, is the person who adds more rules to himself that are not founded upon the word of God. And someone would say, well, I'm the weaker brother, just, you know, because that passage talks about, you know, dealing with the weaker brother, being kind to him, compassionate towards him. If you think you're the weaker brother or the weaker sister, it's not an excuse to stay that way. You need to stop being the weaker brother or sister. And uh, there's freedom in Christ, not freedom to sin, but there is freedom in Christ. As Paul said, I will not be mastered by anything. I'll do anything that doesn't bring forth my edification or edification of others. Okay. That's all i got for you today. Does anyone have questions, objections, or things okay. they want to have? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the verse that you were talking about, Jesus, talking about the offense. Uh, we were offended. That's verse 12. 15, verse 12. Yes, the believe that the Sabbath does equal Yeah, but what I was saying was if they want to be like, if someone wants to be like an SDA or an, and worship God on Saturday and think that's the, that think that's the proper way of doing it, that's fine. We're not condemning other people for that. SDA is obviously most SDA is obviously will condemn people for that if they're not doing that. They would think it's sin for everybody, not just for themselves. And going back to Hebrews three eight, I know we we covered this before, uh, but the skeptic would say, how can we live holy according to this passage? Hebrews 3 8, you said? Hebrews 3 8. Oh, you mean James 3 8. Okay. I'm sorry, James 3 8, yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, people could take that and say we're destined for defeat. And, um, but I, I think that, you know, verses 10 through 12. Uh, defeat that, and you know the more used verse to say that is is verse two, uh, which says we all stumble in many things. And the word stumble there doesn't mean just you make a mistake; it means to sin. Um, and you know I would I wouldn't take that scripture and you know compare it to me saying in front of a church, we aren't obeying God and evangelism. We need to get out there and preach the gospel. And I'm using the word we. And therefore, technically speaking, I'm including myself in it. But I know I'm obeying God and preaching the gospel. So really, I could say, you. And so that's what I think is, is, is happening here. But I, I don't, and some people might not like that interpretation. That's fine. But I don't think we can take verse 2 or verse uh, 8 
and say the tongue cannot be tamed. Uh, that's an absolute command. It cannot be tamed. Or maybe he's saying for verse 8 that that's the tongue as a whole and the whole world will not be tamed. Uh, but I don't think we can take those two scriptures which, and interpret them that way, which contradicts the whole of scripture, all these other passages we have here. And so I, I think a good principle for hermeneutics is that the, that the, the majority interprets the minority. And so when we have things like, you know, 1 John 2, 3, and 4, and 1 John 5, 3, you know, and all of 1 John, and, um, you know, 1 Timothy 2, 19, you know, all, and, and even in, in James himself, if that works is dead, and in, in James uh, 1, 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his, own, his tongue, this, this, but to see his own heart, this one's religious, religious is useless. So if verse 8 is absolute and so is verse 2, then we all have worthless religions. Our useless religion before God. And so we, we're going to ha just have a problem with that. So that, that's how I would, I would inter uh, interpret that. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add to that? It seems like, it seems like that's from this uh, chapter, he's actually wanting us to tame the tongue. Yeah. Because out of the same mouth, we see blessing and cursing my brethren. These things ought not to be suffered. Right. So it doesn't seem like he's giving... You know, yeah, permission to right. have an untamed tongue. Right. Uh, he's actually saying that you can tame it. I think. Yeah, I think so too. I don't think he's saying tame the tongue. and saying, well, you can't do it. Yeah. Right. I don't. I don't think he's saying that. Yeah, we, we've talked about that before. I just wanted to have the children's education to make sure we, yeah. we uh, because the skeptic will bring that up. Sure. Like, point right this to you know out, right. out there in the open air. Hey, look, nobody. What do you mean you live holy? Right. You can't do that with this verse. And the uh, last question I had uh, is about the standard uh, about abstaining from drinking. Mm -hmm. And you don't know we shouldn't uh, set up a standard of no drinking because, you know, we could stumble with your brother. Um, but well, that's not why. The reason I said don't set up a standard for not drinking at all, the weaker brother is the one who's setting up the standard. Right. The one who's, who's uh, allowing himself to drink a glass of wine is not the weaker brother. He's actually the stronger brother because he's liberty. Not, he's allowed to he can control himself and not get into sin. So the reason why we wouldn't want to set up a standard is not found upon the Word of God it's because it makes it a man-made standard and you're calling someone sinful when they're not really sinful. Yeah, and I agree with all that. Yeah. that. That wasn't my question. Uh, my question was about in 1 Timothy 3.3 3, mm -hmm. where it's talking about the leadership um, specifically the overseers not given to wine. Now, I don't know if that means not being a, a, a wine bibber or a drunkard or just not having a glass of wine at all. Right. So, uh, you know, maybe you can clarify that. Yeah. Um, I remember talking about this during the teaching on this. Um, let's see here. That's verse 3. I know I have my notes here somewhere here. Okay, given the wine. Uh, not a reputation of a drinker. It's basically what that means. Uh, does not drink wine often. Does not mean you can't drink wine at all. Yeah. Where, where do you, I don't know where you got that from, but where, where's the source of that? That's from, the, that's from what the Greek says there. Oh, okay. Yeah, not given to wine. That's what it means there. Not given to wine. Uh, and, and in fact, my, my, I, I, did, I didn't get this from the Greek word myself in my lexicon, but my, <clears throat> my Bible has a footnote on the word given, and it says literally, it says addicted. Yeah, so not addicted to wine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, not drinking wine often, not a reputation of a, of a drinker. Uh, now, I mean, there is question as to how much alcoholic content there was in the wine then as compared to today. Uh, there are some people who I know who profess to be Christians who are promoting beer drinking. And, you know, and I'm not so sure I'd promote that because uh, beer has a high alcohol content. I definitely would promote any kind of liquor drinking. That's just foolishness. But if someone wants to drink a glass of wine, I, I can't tell them they can't do that. Now, if they're drinking a glass of wine, it's going to cause them to have self-control, uh, to do things they shouldn't be doing, then I would tell them they shouldn't be doing that. Well, I often, I, when I'm talking to people, I'll find that they're, you know, they're not putting this limit upon themselves. Yeah. You know, well, you know, if I have a, a glass of wine or three or four, what's the difference? And my... my Reputation as well. At some point, you're going to lose your sobriety. Sure. And do you know when that is? Well, I, I can't tell. It depends on what, how much I ate that day, how I'm feeling. 
Well, so then you shouldn't certainly go beyond a glass of wine. Yeah. You know, just being sober-minded and diligent sure. about your faith. Right. Uh, it would be ridiculous to put yourself in that spiritual um, danger. Right. Because it is spiritual danger. And that's, uh, uh, you know, drunkenness is a huge spiritual danger. So. Sure. Sure. And it's because of these things a lot of people have chosen to remain, you know, abstinent from these things. Uh, I know I used to be a drunkard. And uh, even after I became a Christian, I backslid when I drunk again. And I, I said to myself, I'm only going to drink one beer. And I drank another one. I drank another one. I drank another one. And that was it. And uh, I became a hypocrite in the eyes of many people that night because of that. And so, you know, it's a very dangerous thing to play with, especially if you've had problems in the past with it. Now, the smell of beer is disgusting to me. I mean, when we go to places where people are drunk and you can smell the trash cans are full with the beer bottles, it just makes me want to puke. And so, it brings me back to my original state where when I first started drinking as a 15, 16 year old, I had to force myself to drink because I wanted it to be cool. Yeah, I'm going to get used to it eventually, and I did. I started to like it. And so, uh, but we just need to be careful making, that was just an example, that's a, a prevalent thing I see happening. It's just an example to, to give about this, that we don't make things rules that aren't founded upon the Word of God explicitly and say you're sinful if you're not doing this. You know. And uh, I'm sorry to have some questions there. One last one. Problem, brother. Going back to James, uh, James 3, mm -hmm. uh, 3 9. And uh, bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a uh, here's a verse that would definitely contradict this whole sinful nature uh, precept concept that men are promoting. Well after the fall, well after the fall. This is well after the yeah, fall this here. Is well after the yeah. fall. Yeah. Right. Four thousand years after the fall, they're still made in the likeness of men. Right. And one of the reasons you shouldn't be cursing them, according to this verse, is that they're made in the likeness of God. Right. So it's pre. And this just popped in my head. As preachers, we shouldn't be cursing people. Right. Right. Yeah. Cursing people as we preach to them. You know. Mm -hmm. Be blessing, you know, person. Yeah. The Lord said that, that we should, yeah, we should be blessing, bless those who curse you. Right. And so, if, if the tongue, if he's saying the tongue can't be tamed, then Jesus actually told you to, to use it to bless, not curse. Right. And Jesus commanded you to do something you couldn't do too. Right. Right. Maybe he didn't know that it wasn't tameable. Right. Right. You know I mean? Of course it is. If he can tell you bless those who curse you, because obviously the ones you would be tempted to curse are the ones that are persecuting you the most. Like right. Jesus is saying there, those who persecute you, right? You know, those who do evil, spitefully use you, bless them. And, uh, and right. Obviously, really again, these kinds of inordinate actions by preaching in the streets really keeps many true believers coming to to support and, and actually, uh, you know, become part of the open air ministry. Because they see this, they go, well, that's, that's not God. So then they, then they take the Westboro Baptist Church image in their mind and say, that's, and every time you put up a banner, they're calling you Westboro Baptist Church, right? Sure. And uh, so they reject all preachers because of the, the uh, um, sinful behavior of, of some. Right. So cursing would be saying something false. Yes. Would that be, or how would you, in the open air, how would you define cursing? I think it's cursing is... Cuss words. Sure, sure. You, I think it would include that. But it's just, it's just wanting ill will towards the person, I think. That's what it is. And so I, I want the best for them. I want, I, that's love. And so I, I don't want the worst for them. Um, now the Apostle Paul, he uh, blinded the sorcerer. That was for his own good. Yeah, that was for his own good. It was a, that was a about as strong rebuke as you can get. Money perish with you. No, that was that that was Peter. That was Peter. I'm talking about Paul here, where that guy was telling lies to the the ruler, and it led to the ruler's salvation. Because he saw what had happened, so it was for the good. Uh, but that that doesn't give all open air preachers the right to go around. You know, doing those things, they're saying, I, I've prayed for 900 people to die, and they've all died. You know, that's what I've heard one guy say. So, um, or, or homosexuals are so ugly they can't get a, a wife or a husband. Because right. they're, obviously, you're, you're so ugly. You yeah. know, that's why you're a lesbian. That's why you're a lesbian. That's you're why you're, you're a homosexual, because you can't get a husband or a wife. Well, who is that? Who is 
that preacher to judge the person on the surface the way God made them. He's looking at that person and saying, you're ugly. What are you talking about? And, uh, you know, I, I have a, you know, you all know my situation. Our, our daughter is beautiful. But she's not living according to God's will. And, uh, you know, that uh, the outside of the cup is not what God's looking at. Would be Christian then because you'd be yes. saying you can't obey God because you are this man. Right. Know, it makes them like, they're just damned. That, yeah. They're just the whole, yeah, the whole reason why they became lesbians is because God made them this way and God made it too hard for them to stay straight. Yeah. yeah. So we need to be real careful about what we're saying. And, uh, and, and really, that shows those people's hearts. Not just the sinners, but the preachers. It shows their heart. Now, their heart's not right before God. And uh, it's laid bare for everyone to see. And the ironic thing is that they, they don't... They're so, these, so many people are so deluded and so deceived that they, they'll actually put these videos on the internet for everyone to see. He's like, if I did that at one time and it slipped out of my mouth on accident, I probably wouldn't put it on, on, on YouTube unless I was showing an example of how not to do things and look what I did, I shouldn't have done this. But to keep uploading videos that's doing the same thing, it's like, man, how blind can you be? After a while, I think you get it's on delusion, right? More and more and more to it. Yeah. Where if you're not checking yourself, you're not examining yourself, asking the Lord to search you and see if there was anything sure. that was not right. Right. Then you probably do that more and more and more. Any of us could probably go down that road. Yeah. And drift that way. Yeah, I was watching a video series that one that I confronted on Jesse's message board again. And someone had posted it somewhere. And uh, it's just disgusting. It just disgusts me. And he's still. And they're leading people. They're teaching people how to preach like this. Yeah. Even their own family members. And most people are kind of they have this false sense of fear that they're kind of scared to rise up and say anything about it because these people have been doing it for so long and they're kind of the fathers of this movement and you know, who am I to say anything against them? But no, if they're walking in sin, they need to be told. They someone need to say something. So. Okay. How about the, the plant, uh, this one, about the, the verse there in Matthew 15 about the planting? Because I could see, you know, I could see how those who, who uh, say we don't have free will. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're, they they are tares, obviously. They're, that the Father plants. Yeah, they're, they are. The Father is the one who does, he does it all, and right. you don't have any part in it. How would you describe the, the planting there? What? What does the Father do? Where does He plant us? And kind of maybe explain that a little bit about how sure. the Father plants you. Okay, well, we got the, if you go back to the parable of the sower, we see how uh, the Father plants. He sows seed, the Word of God. But what determines whether this seed will come to fruition and bear fruit or not? The condition of the soil. And so this is right after Jesus started using, this is, the, this is one of the first parable Jesus is using which is right after the Pharisees are calling him of the devil and rejecting the light they're receiving that he's giving them. You know, this is, he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he's taught all these things throughout here, um, and they keep rejecting, 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 and the second time they call him of the devil, he talks about the unpardonable sin, and he talks about the greater judgment for greater knowledge. He talks about that in, in Matthew 12, 41 and 42. And that's when he starts talking about the parable of the sower. And the first ground he talks about is the hard ground. Okay? That the seed is sown on the hard ground and the seed doesn't penetrate. So the devil comes around and steals it from there. So God plants things by sowing the seed of the gospel into hearts that are prepared for the gospel. Now, God doesn't determine the ground, doesn't determine the condition of the ground, or how the ground will go from there on out. Where the ground will have thorns around it that chokes it out. Uh, where the ground will, uh, it's so shallow or rocky that it won't let it, the, the seed penetrate as far as it needs to penetrate. God doesn't determine any of those things according to Scripture. All that He's determining is the Word of God, what it is, and that He's planting it. So the people determine whether the Word of God takes fruit and bears fruit in their life. And the next parable He talks about is the parable of the wheat and tares. And so those who don't accept the seed of, of the gospel into their lives, they're tear, they're not a wheat. 
and they are planted uh, by the wicked one. But that doesn't mean that these people who Jesus is talking about here uh, had no free will, that the devil by force took them and planted them. That is found nowhere in there. And everything we've read so far through Matthew, like him talking about the good tree and the bad tree, that there's good trees and there's bad trees, and they produce good fruit or bad fruit. And, but he's telling them, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. So the, the plant, would you say that the plant is the actual person or the seed, the word of God? Well, the, plant that he... the plant is the person, the person. but if, if you're a good plant, a good tree, it's the result of God sowing the seed of the word of God into your heart, and you're allowing it because the ground, the soil of your heart, which you prepare, you determine that, is allowed to bring forth much fruit. So that would go with James 1, where it says, Lay aside the overflow of wickedness and right. filthiness and receive the implanted word that you're right. able to save your soul. Yes. The implanted word. So that, that would be probably the implanted word. You yes. prepare and God will plant it there. Yes. God plants the word. He does it through preachers. He does it through the Holy Spirit. He does it through your conscience. He does it through just the word of God itself. You're reading it for yourself. Situations. He does it through that. Uh, so there's... We don't determine the word of God preached to us, but we determine how we're going to receive it, how we're going to submit to it, what we're going to allow it to do in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that seed that's there, good soil, it grows. Yes. And brings forth fruit. So you're automatically a good tree now. Good tree. Everyone else is a bad tree. Okay, and they're under the dominion of Satan, under his control, not by force from Satan, or by force from God, but by force from the person themselves. They're choosing to be a slave to sin. It's good to kind of go through that again because I can sure. see how that verse can, can be twisted. Right. You know? Yes. Same thing with the John 6 verse where no one comes to me unless the Father draws in. Same kind of right. verses that are twisted sometimes, not, right. not looked at in the context of the rest of the scripture. Right. And, and Jesus is trying to, to say, I mean, Jesus has done all, I think he's done everything he can do with these people because these are the same people who called him of the devil. So they, they may have already committed the unpardonable sinner to the point of no return. So he, he may have done all he can for these people. Uh, but he's trying to save those who might follow him. That's why he addresses the multitude. After he addresses them himself, he addresses the multitudes. And um, That's it, where he gives them over there and let them alone. Right, so let them alone. Have nothing to do with them. Place. Don't follow them. Give them over. Uh, ignore them. And uh, that's what Jesus says. But you see, the, the, the you know, the Pharisees don't come and ask for interpretation of the parable here, or what Jesus is saying. Who comes to them and wants more understanding, even though they should have understood it by now? Peter. So those who want more understanding are always seeking for more. Those who could care less, they hear it, they might get offended by it, but they, they'll just go on. It's the same thing you see happening in the other parables, too. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and tares. Disciples are always coming to him, and, and even other people are coming to him and asking him for more information, understanding of this. And he explained it to them. But the Pharisees don't come. They've hardened their heart. They've done it themselves. It's kind of like those that appoint themselves to a certain place of authority when God yeah. hasn't given them authority. Right. You know, right. Those, those, those leaders, right. those religious leaders, they, they were not representing God. They weren't his representatives. They planted themselves yeah. in that place. Well, if they were speaking from God's word, then they would have his authority. Because they're speaking from man-made traditions, who, whose authority do they have? Man's. Which is worthless. In God's eyes. So there, there's a lot of pastors nowadays who plant themselves in yeah. places of authority. Yeah. And they don't represent God. They don't speak God's word. Yeah. You made that point during the teaching, brother, the last thing I got it, and that is it's a really important point for believers, especially young believers, uh, about the Holy Spirit teaching us all things, mm -hmm. that we study to show ourselves approved, and the teachers be willing to, to be examined according to what they've taught from God's Word. Mm -hmm. If you have that, all those elements... All those checks and balances. All those checks and balances, you know, within the body of Christ, uh, the local fellowship, then uh, things get pure and pure as we right. seek the Lord individually, and uh, test uh, what we're being taught, and it's a, it's a great thing. Yeah, there's freedom, there's peace, there's love, there's growth, there's variety in the body of Christ. We're not some cookie-cutter thing that we're all dressing the same clothes and wearing the same color head coverings and the same fabric and wearing the same glasses and have the same facial hair and 
you know, oh, I have to have the little chi right here with the black rim glasses and the, you know, <laughs> and the tight, you know, tight jeans and, and, and wearing these cool fashionable things. We don't, all, we don't have to have that thing, that kind of stuff. There's variety in the body of Christ. Not everyone's going to be an eyelash, not everyone's going to be an eye, not everyone's going to be a foot, a year. We're all different. And so there's going to be that kind of stuff. And, and, and really, what it develops in the body of Christ is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You're following Jesus. You're letting Him speak to you. You're letting Him lead you individually, personally, and your family, instead of just doing what everyone else does. You're letting Him lead you. And that's the way it should be. And, and if, if, I, if I were to go to a church where every single body, everyone was exactly the same way in everything, I would have great concern for the individual relationship for everyone there and thinking, well, you know, are they, is God really leading every single person the same exact way? I would have a hard time believing that. I would have concern as whether they're just following a set of rules that are actually getting this from Jesus Christ himself when it comes to these doubtful things or, you know, preferences they have. Yeah. Take Christ, right? Right. 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 That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. That's not good. No. All right. Anyone else? So now, if everybody starts wearing. You know, polo shirts, polo shirts, brother. I'll have to rebuke you. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's a little darker than yours. Mine's got stripes. Mine's nicer. <laughs>